Greetings, friends. Wow, can you believe it? We're at the end of the liturgical year. For those of you who have been keeping track, this will be the last week that we preach out of Year A selectionary, Matthew. And on the last Sunday of the year, we, or weekend of the year, we celebrate Christ the King uh, weekend. And that's why the pyramids are white today. Um, uh, Christ the King is what we acknowledge Him. The buildup all year has been since the birth, last year in Advent, all the way through the whole year, the whole focus in Matthew has been building up and building up and building up to the kingship of Christ. And so tonight, by way of a real fast little recap, it began with John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus' adult ministry began with John the Baptist publicly proclaiming, Behold, the one that was foretold is here. A voice calling out from the wilderness, saying, Make straight the paths for the Lord. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is coming near. And so with that, he heralded the baptism for repentance that he was doing. And in the, the end of chapter 3, beat Jesus gets baptized. And if we, you might remember that Jesus, John the Baptist says, Whoa, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus says, No, it's good and proper that we do it this way. And then in chapter 4, Jesus goes out and gets tempted. And in chapter 5, he comes back and he teaches the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount has some particular... Uh, um, references for us tonight in the, the scripture we're going to read. But then he goes on to the 5, 6, and 7 were the Sermon on the Mount chapters in Matthew. And then you get to chapter 10, and that's the missional discourse. Remember, that's when he spoke to his disciples and he told them they were going to go out and do things. They were going to heal people of diseases and leprosy and of demonic possession. And they were going to do all these good things and they were going to go out and do all this stuff, and that they were going to be persecuted and prosecuted and things were going to happen to them. That was early in Matthew. Then in chapter 13, we begin what was known as the, the parable discourse where Jesus told a lot of the parables uh, uh, through chapter 13 that most of us are familiar with. Not all of them, but quite a few. And then in chapter 18, he told us the community discourse, the church discourse, or what to do in the life of a church if there's challenges or People not getting along in church. Of course, that never happens in church. But just in case it does, Jesus went ahead and laid out some, some heads up of what we should do. And then in chapter 24, he begins the end times discourse. It's a, the fancy word for it is the eschatological discourse. But eschatology is a real fancy word for the end of times. Okay, it's, it's the, the uh, all of Revelation is eschatology. Daniel has a significant part in it. It's eschatology. And here in Matthew, we've got two chapters to deal with eschatology. And that's 24 and 25. And in 24, you might recall, in 24, chapter 3, he takes his disciples out of the temple. They're away from the temple now. Because remember, it was still on Monday. We're still on that Monday. Okay? And then he's up on the Mount of Olives, and he gave instructions to his disciples. And then he told them a series of four parables. The first one was the, the wise servant. We didn't cover that one in, in services. Then the next one was the, the, the bridesmaids, the ten virgins. And then there was the talents last week. And this week, there's a whole lot of uh, disagreement among academics and theologians as to whether uh, uh, this particular last part is a parable or not. Uh, some say it is, some say it isn't. I'm just going to say it's Scripture, and I'm going to leave it at that for the purposes of, of preaching for tonight. But tonight we're going to end chapter 25, and this is a time of judgment. And so let's read this, what this judgment is is about beginning in chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. And let's hear Jesus' words regarding, regarding the judgment that he's talking about. And then we'll go back and dissect this and see if we can make sense of it. Jesus is continuing his discourse from last week. This tails right along into the end of the talents. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever, whatever you did not do for the one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, the first thing, let's just deal with this as if it was a parable for just a minute. And in the sense of the parable, there are metaphors in here, things that we need to understand these other meanings. And even if it's not a parable, there's some things you should understand. First of all is the, he gathers the nations. The, the Greek word used for the nations here is ethne. It's like ethics, only it's ethne. And this word Matthew has used in other places in his gospel, and it nearly always applies to Gentiles. In fact, in some places in Matthew, when it's translated to English, it is the word Gentile. But in the Greek text, it's ethne. So when we're hearing this gathering of the nations, and Jesus is, this is end time prophecy here. This does not, this, this, this set of verses right here does not happen in a vacuum. It happens as part of the Olivet Discourse. It happens as Jesus is telling these stories one after the other, four of them in a row, only to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. So we have the audience, we have the occasion. And in case you had forgotten, Matthew was written after the temple was destroyed to Jewish Christians. The book of Matthew, was in, its intended audience was to Jewish Christians. So all the people he's writing, he's, that Jesus is talking to here at that time, all this, these are all Jewish Christians. They don't even know they're Christians yet. They're Jewish disciples of Christ. So when he's speaking to them about these things, they might recall what he said when he's talking to them. He's about, you know, you gave me food, you gave me drink. Well, if we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verses 6, he says, Blessed are you when you thirst and hunger for righteousness. So this thirsty and hungry is not just about food and water. It could be about food and water, certainly, but it's not just about food and water. It's also those who are thirsting for the things of God. And we should understand that this gathering of the nations here is not necessarily Christians because, friends, when Jesus comes back, you do recall that when He comes back, first those who are asleep in Christ are raised, and then those that are on the earth in Christ are raised with Him. So presumably, going on a limb here, presumably all of us have already joined with Him. You with me? So this gathering of the nations is not us. It's the Gentiles. It's the rest of the world. Okay? Now, out of the rest of the world, there's people that maybe they heard about Jesus. Maybe they're friendly towards Jesus Christians. Maybe they're antagonistic towards Christians. There's some of all that out there that people don't go to church. I know people that are not opposed to Jesus. They don't not like Christians, but they wouldn't call themselves an active churchgoer. They don't actually belong to a church. They don't actually read their Bible, but they probably have one at home someplace. Maybe it's their grandmothers and they just inherited it. I don't know. But they're not opposed to Christians. 
And what Jesus is talking about, He's gathered them, okay, together. So this is the end times judgment that's here. We've got to be clear about who He's talking about. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there might not be some everyday churchgoers that might not be in that crowd because you remember the parable about, parable about the wheat and the tares? Y'all remember that? Do you remember the implications of that particular parable? That there are people that might be in churches, that might be professing Christians, but yet their hearts aren't right. And they know their hearts aren't right. They participate in discord. They're antagonistic. They don't mend fences. They don't do the things that Jesus told us to do. Forgive seven times 70 and all that stuff. Okay, So there might conceivably be some out there in this crowd. Now in those days, unique to Palestine, unique to Palestine, the shepherds often had goats and sheep in the same flock out there in the fields. But curious thing, at night they had to separate them because the sheep with their extra fur were okay in the cold. They could stand the colder nights, no problem. But the goats could not. So every night the shepherds would have to separate them even though they were grazing together during the day. And the goats would have to go into a more sheltered place at night to stay warm. That's something I learned this week. Okay? So only in Palestine did they, did they actually do that. Nowhere else do the shepherds herd sheep and goats together. That's only in Palestine that, they, that that's been known to occur. So as he's speaking to these Jewish disciples and he's telling this story of sheep and goats, they understood the separating part. They understood that. They understood that they would even be together. And then when he gets to the part about the food and the drink and clothes, me, this is the part that gets kind of questioning because it did, I don't know if you caught this or not, but both sides were surprised. When he told the ones on the right, when you gave me something to drink, when you gave me something to eat, and you clothed me and you fed me, welcome, my Father's blessed you, and so welcome to his righteousness. When did we do that? When did we do that? They questioned, when did we do that? So see, those are the people among the nations that help Christians. Because remember now, he's speaking to his disciples, and he's telling them about the end of times. If you remember back in chapter 10, because I know you probably studied it before you came tonight, in Matthew chapter 10, in the missional discourse, Jesus told them, Go out. Don't take anything with you. Don't take gold, silver. Don't take your iPad. Don't take your smartphone. Just go and share the good news. Teach, heal, preach. Do all the stuff that I've commanded you to do. Oh, and by the way, people go to people that will take care of you. The first house that will take you in, that will feed you and clothe you. People will take care of you. Jesus told his disciples that they were going to go and do. And now the people that are in the sheep line here are the people that took care of them. These are the people in the sheep line. These are the people that took care of the Christians that were out spreading the gospel. Because see, while we go out, because remember, we're big part of this is about being ready, right? That's this whole chapter 24 and 25 has been about being ready. What are we doing in the time between when Jesus ascended to heaven and he comes back? What are we doing in that time? And that's where tonight's scripture falls in that section. So our part in this is the ones that are going out there being the face of Jesus to the world. We're the ones that are getting the water, the food, the clothing, the visit. And the people that are giving us those things and accommodating us and taking care of us or helping us, even if they're not necessarily doing what we're doing, they're accommodating what we're doing. Do you all follow what I'm saying? Those are the ones that Jesus is going to count as blessed, and they're going to get an invitation. Into the, but the ones in the goat lines, the ones that have already shown a propensity for opposing, being in the way, persecuting, not feeding, not drinking, not visiting, not doing all that, being antagonistic towards the gospel message. That's who Jesus is dividing up here. On Christ the King weekend, 
We're celebrating Jesus' kingship by virtue of this final judgment when He comes and sits on His heavenly throne. That's what it said, heavenly throne. So if we're doing our parts all along the way, like the wise servant, who when the master comes back finds him doing what he's supposed to be doing, that's what that parable is about. And the ten virgins, the five wise ones who were doing what they were supposed to be doing, they had the oil, the reserve, to get them into the banquet at the final judgment. And the people with the talents, the five and the two who went out and exercised in faith and in belief with what Jesus gave them, and they doubled it, and they were rewarded because they exercised the mercy and the love that they were given, and they shared it with others. And he who was given is given more. They were given mercy and love by God, just like all of us. And so when Jesus came back and he saw that they had doubled the mercy and love by giving more, they doubled what they got, they fully gave out. And they gave more because you can't give it all away. Remember we talked about that last week. And each of us has been extended mercy and love by God when we accepted Christ and we were justified. And then the mercy and the love continued, continues to this day through our sanctification. And we're called to share that. And no matter what happens, we can't lose those talents. No one can take away from us the mercy and the love that God showed us. We're at the and some people accommodate us sharing it, and some people don't. Sheep and the goats. We need to be clear about that. Now, and if you want to include in this that it does include the people in the church, okay, fine. But in all the studies that I did, it was tenuous. The, the thread that ties this parable, the sheep and the goats, to active, participating Christians. That doesn't mean us. All the nations, it could mean us. But mostly it means all the others, the Gentile others that Matthew was talking about, that Jesus was talking to his disciples up on the mount that evening. So he's given us a final warning here that we need, and what we're supposed to get from this is the urgency that we have to share the gospel because don't we want to provision as many of those others as possible to be with us in eternity? You do understand that that's really God's plan, right? God's plan is to welcome as many of those He created into the kingdom of heaven as possible. Knowing full well there are some that are going to flat out reject it. We know this, right? History's been littered with them. Maybe our own experience is littered with them. In fact, when you go to Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, You think I came to bring peace? I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I will pit brother against brother, father against son, mother against daughter, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He will pit families. And he says, for some people, your biggest enemies will be members of your own blood, your own family. And by enemies, he means people that are antagonistic towards your walk with God. Those are the enemies he's referring to. And some of us may have members of our own family that... They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in what we're doing. They think it's mythology. They think it's some kind of hocus pocus or whatever. They can't believe we go and do this every week. But then when we encounter scripture like this, where Jesus' own words are that some are going to be divided out and thrown into the eternal fire with the devil and his angels, that's our urgency, friends, to maintain our perseverance to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as we can. Because if we truly acknowledge Jesus as our king, then we'll be doing the king's work. Like the wise servant, when Jesus returns, he will find us doing the king's work. Doing whatever it is he's asked us to do. And I am confident that each one of us has a slightly different thing to do because God put each of us in a slightly different place. Sure, we come together for worship here. Yeah, we serve together. We study the Bible together. We go to women's study, men's study together. We do these things together, but yet 
we're all in a slightly different place. The things we have in common are children of God and disciples of Christ and sinners. But we all acknowledge Jesus as King. And as our King, ours is to obey. Because He told us He came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. He said not one pen stroke, not one jot, not one tittle of Hebrew is to go away until He comes back. So friends, have you, over the last couple of weeks, have you been thinking about what it is that you do or are called to do or have been called to do and may be resistant to do or don't want to do or all the above before Jesus comes back? If Jesus comes back tonight, would you be able to give an accounting for the work you've been doing for God? Following God's will. It doesn't mean just works out here in the world. It means following God's will for your life. Now the pastor wants to show me your calendar and your checkbook and I'll, I'll tell you if you have enough ev evidence to be convicted of being a Christian. Because your calendar will be filled up with things that are related to your faith life. And your checkbook register will probably have entries in it that show where you put some of your treasure in terms of your faith life. So is there enough evidence in your existence to where if Jesus comes back, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian, convict you of being a person that Jesus says, come on in, I know you. Or are you going to hear the words, go away, I don't know you. Or are you going to be surprised maybe, when did I not? do that for you. You can see the other group was surprised too. When did I not do that? When did I not take care of you? Not that I know what Jesus looks like, but when did I not take care of you? See, I think each of us know what Jesus looks like. We see it in the faces of our fellow church members. We see it in the faces of the people we encounter out there. And sometimes that face convicts us, doesn't it? Because we see something in somebody that renders our heart and makes us realize, wow, i got to do more, or I should be doing more, or I need to do something about this or about that. Friends, when those prompts come, they're coming from the Holy Spirit. May you recognize that. The King has provided us with the Holy Spirit to give us contact with Him, regular communication with Him until He returns. My fervent prayer for all of you and for all of our Christian brothers and sisters, wherever they might be, not just Grace Wesleyans, but wherever we're, the Holy Christian Church, wherever they may be, my fervent prayer is that when the King comes, He finds us doing His work. In the name of the Father, and the Son.